hands of Christ are the biggest blessing. And then we have Tristan Janelle, Program Management Officer at the Secretariat of the Convention of the Biological Diversity. And I'm glad you're still standing after Kali. And thanks for that work. And then we also have Charlotte Monson, the Program Director of the Village Foundation, coming in online. But let me start by you, Celeste, if I may. People's local communities, their practices, their culture, their cultures, their knowledge, uh, and how we are, um, uh, again, respecting and, and supporting them in that, uh, but also that we are giving them sufficient space in order to take forward their own practices and cultures so that we can collectively achieve these global targets that, uh, that we have committed to. Um, within biodiversity and climate change, which is the area that I specifically manage uh, within the Secretariat, we did have a quite a, a positive decision that talks about the synergies between this process and the CBD, as well as others recognizing the inter interconnected and interdependent crises that we are facing. Uh, recognizing the value, valuable role that IPCC has taken uh, and IFES as well, of course, uh, and trying to encourage further integration between these two processes, recognizing some of the challenges that, that Jim has mentioned. Um, but also that, uh, that uh, the various forms of knowledge are sufficiently taken uh, together and, and being um, uh, built on in terms of leading to effective, effective action. Um, there are some things within the decision, though, that are quite challenging. There was one specific request that asked for us to provide guidance on managing ecosystems within a changing climate, um, which can be very superficial at a global level, but also extremely locally uh, contextualized. And that is going to be a, a, a challenge, uh, uh, taking that forward into something that is, that is meaningful. And again, it's engaging with the uh, scientific community with indigenous peoples, local communities, with civil society, with the, the various financial mechanisms that uh, uh, financial actors that are out there, and uh, to ensure that well, we're we're not just providing superficial guidance on this, but actually something that is meaningful. Uh, but again, the fact that we have extremely limited time in order in order to do this. Um, Yes, the, the COP did not finalize all of this work. One of the key decisions around resource mobilization was not, uh, was not taken because of time constraints and, and, uh, and all the rest of it. Um, but overall, yes, it was a very positive outcome, uh, a very positive COP as a COP for the people, as, as our Colombian hosts uh, uh, very effectively promoted. Uh, it was our biggest COP ever, uh, including 200,000 people going through the green zone, as well as uh, around 20,000 people registered, which I know relative to UN efficacy is, is, uh, is very small, but relatively small. Um, but I think it's also a very positive sign about the growing recognition of biodiversity of nature uh, as part of our collective challenges that we are addressing, not least the climate change one. Um, and uh, the, the question now is how are we working together, all of us coming together within our respective skill sets and, and uh, focuses and priorities and aligning them so that we are ultimately achieving uh, uh, and uh, effectively addressing the, the uh, joint crises that we are facing, whether it's biodiversity loss, climate change, pollution, etc. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Christian. That was a great bridge to our next online guest, uh, Charlotte Monson, who we have online. We're getting a lot. Charlotte? So, so Charlotte, from a foundation perspective, from a foundation perspective, Charlotte, what do you think is needed to accelerate the achievement? We can hear you. Well, now we can't. 
Yes, now we can. And now I have been allowed to take off my moderator hat and put on my action hat. Because if we're talking about the triple crisis and governance and how to accelerate the achievement of the 30 by 30, we have not spoken a lot about people. But if we talk about govern governments, governments are affected by people. And how can we engage the really many, the many, many millions, if not millions of people in these, these, these subjects. We spoke a little bit about how 
you know, when it becomes, when the 1.5 degree becomes something that people can feel, see, live in the world for ways, then people engage in it. Yeah. But from here, you and I, we're still in the United Nations. What we do is we look at the population of people who are not living in the United Nations, and we look at the population of people who are not living in the United Nations. What we do is we work with popular culture to engage the many people in the United Nations. Not just at the planetary side, but also on the people side. I work in the United Nations for the people. And I'm just going to give you a little example of something that in less than six months has mobilized tremendously. And I put a couple of words to it. Look at this group. And we need the sound too. And you start it over with the sound. Just stop it and then uh, play it again with sound. And it listen very hard because I can hear it's there. All right, well then, they are um, working on the technique here. I'm going to ask the polemic question. Who's the oldest, most underpaid artist in the world? Okay, we're not, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. It's nature. Nature has never been paid for her sounds or anything else that she has. Until half a year ago, when we were live from musicians, creatives, uh, environmental organizations and public good foundations to almost this. Okay, so now n nature is an artist on the biggest streaming platforms in the world. That means nature owns their own nature sound. When they are streamed, royalties go back to nature and conservation. We got 15 big artists from different areas of the world, different genres to mix nature's nature sounds into their music when they are streamed, nature royalties go back. In two weeks, nature made it to the top 1% of artists on Spotify. And last week we hit 80 million streams. So we have now millions and millions and millions of people engaged in planetary issues People who vote, people who buy, people who act, people who can look at how they transport, how they live, how they eat, how they engage. So now they are starting to move. It's new people who have not been engaged before. So, sounds right, it's the music, because it sounds right, it's nature, it's an artist. And if, when we want to accelerate action, and when we want to reach the top, we need to get a lot more people. I think it's so impressive to see this panel and what you have managed to get together from different areas. And let's also engage the many people. And now I'm putting on my model.
Thanks, Ryan. So now I'm putting on my modern hat again, and then I will uh, ask the floor if there are questions to our issue. Any questions? So, what is so impressive to see is how you managed to get a wonderful different organizations together. So, if we look at what needs to be done, I think we probably go you know, from the science to the action to the on the ground. So, How can the UN agencies, IMO, IPCC, and CPD work together to achieve this? And I'm asking this question having worked for four different UN agencies, and also knowing, you know, truth be told, that it's not always that they work together. Now you're sitting on the tent, how can you work together? One of the main areas, at least, that I'm taking at IMO in relation to how we work with other agencies um, is not to be so protective of our work. Uh, at the UN agencies, and this has to do also with the member states, the jurisdictional aspects, uh, and the remit that is each organization has, we tend to be quite protective and defend what we do. Um, because there's competition between the agencies, also when we go out to require the necessary funding, um, we are now coming to a realization, and this is a, a very a recent conversation that we have just well, five days ago, into how internally with all the agencies, we're going to start to develop a guidance for us to not to compete, but to help each other. Now, there are practical aspects where constantly we receive the cooperation. The Conference on Biodiversity and IMO share a lot of experience and expertise when it comes to protection of the ocean because we rely on their data. Similarly to what we do with WMO, without the climate data, the meteorological data, it's not possible for us to actually enhance it. The next phase is how we translate that into the different agencies at the member states levels, at the country level, to also be coordinated. And there is more work to do there, but I can tell you that we all realize in that whenever we say we're going to cooperate is now the action that we're going to actually put in place for that cooperation to materialize. Yeah. Sure, that, that actually brings me back to an even more fundamental question, which, which is what is IPCC and who actually owns it? Uh, because it's not a UN agency, it's an intergovernmental body which is hosted by two UN organizations, WMO and UNEP. And I, off, I, I can't do this while I'm holding a microphone. I was going to hold up my fingers to create a triangle and say that IPCC is actually a triangle of interests. There's the two UN host organizations of one apex, there's the governments at the other apex, and there's the scientists at the third apex. And each of these groups think they are IPCC and own it. And they're all right and they're all wrong because IPCC cannot operate unless these three groups collaborate. It can only work with the consent of all these three groups. So when we think about the collaboration, I think about, you know, the, the first answer to the question was about institutional collaboration between the agencies. That is probably really quite hard for IPCC. And we constantly uh, get pushback from some of our governments on collaboration as well. I mean, the IPBES IPCC collaboration has not always enthusiastically been embraced by all our governments, if I can put it as delicately as possible. Which is why when I made my introductory remarks, I emphasized the question of science-to-science -science collaboration between our sister environmental assessments. Because quite frankly, we can go and get things done without asking permission from upstairs to go and do it. There's many practical things we can just get on with because we share scientific communities. 
And that was the explicit conversation I've had with David Agora of the protests about how, how we move forward. We can make a lot of progress without changing our procedures, without doing you know, very ambitious things upstairs, as it were. So that's why I'm enthusiastic. I just want to get on and do it, basically. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Jim is absolutely right. Uh, and certainly as a uh, convention secretariat of a party-driven process, sometimes the collaborations can be challenging because we need to have a mandate to go out and, and, and to do that. And certainly a, a recognition of IPCC uh, AR6 within, within CBD has been a challenge because certain parties aren't quite so enthusiastic. And we saw that even just a couple of weeks ago in Cali, where references to certain terms used by IPCC, there was there were challenges to, to whether or not we could necessarily use them within within our process. And so that is certainly at an institutional level that can be quite uh, quite a quite a challenge. Um, but having said that, on a more individual level and taking advantage of uh, the fact that that other agencies and other, other processes are at least looking at some of these issues from their own particular perspective can be very beneficial and something that we can build on. Uh, so certainly within IMO, and I, I should have mentioned actually the engagement with the private sector in my earlier intervention, but uh, the fact that as a, as a body that looks very much more so at private sector activities can be very beneficial even if there isn't necessarily reference to IMO within a CBD decision on cooperation with other, with other agencies. And with IPCC, certainly that can be quite challenging. Um, but um, yes, the joint workshop between yourselves and, and, and IPES was quite well embraced by, by parties within, within CBD to a certain, to a certain extent. Um, but it's, it's that sort of uh, uh, collaboration, even if it's not necessarily a, a sort of formally adopted or, or taken on board at a, at a sort of a higher level, we can certainly take from that and use that as an opportunity for uh, um, consistent uh, messaging and, and hopefully engaging with people outside of what might be our little bubble of conservation people. But how are we engaging with the climate community? with the shipping community, et cetera, um, and, and looking at how we can take this forward, even if uh, some of those collaborations might be politically challenged. Thanks a lot. Well, I think it shows, again, protecting all the answers, a lot of the collaboration is between people and not activations. Not, not, not that people just say, we want to do it. And on a high water, there might be barriers, but we do and, and now we're sitting here, we can be by a like So asking our, our colleagues and the system, what is it that the foundations can do for you apart from giving money? And asking, uh, asking uh, Charlotte and Francisca, what is it that you would like to see happen to nos ha dicho eh, de que hay algo y quiero como poner así como algo importante que tiene que ver con las relaciones y los vínculos
si nosotros queremos cambiar las organizaciones, si queremos cambiar el cambio climático, si queremos cambiar la empresa, ¿cómo lo vamos a cambiar? Y eso tiene que ver con un cambio personal. Yo creo que hoy en día la empresa o, el, o las organizaciones, así como las que estamos acá, IPCC, WMO, etcétera, etcétera. Lo principal es que entre nosotros no estemos cambiando. Que entre nosotros no, no tengamos... Que, que realmente en la organización que estemos sea como una familia. Cuando somos una familia, cuando tenemos un propósito tan fuerte como lo que estamos viviendo hoy en día, los equipos se coaccionan y creo que los desafíos se pueden lograr mucho más fácil. Un ejemplo real es la alianza que llevamos con el PCC y WMO hace cinco años, donde realmente hemos podido trabajar de una manera eh, humana, eh, lo hemos pasado bien, ha sido mucho trabajo, pero lo hemos pasado bien. Y creo que el éxito de estos cinco años trabajando con, con las organizaciones tiene que ver con los mismos. Tiene que ver cómo nos relacionamos y cómo nos respetamos y cómo nos abrimos los espacios, cómo no, te, no competimos unos con otros, sino son todos un equipo, somos una familia. Es importante también ver qué está pasando con nuestras familias en la casa. Para saber también cómo podemos trabajar con la familia que nos acompaña todos los días, que son las organizaciones de la Llegó el momento de no aplicarse adelante, sino Okay, uh, j just very quickly, and to say, as uh, somebody from Scotland, of course, I would always accept money, uh, you know, for doing things. But to, to answer your question specifically, uh, I could see a specific role, for example, you know, we in IPCC have the challenge of, of incorporating Indigenous people's knowledge better. The problem is that knowledge is not in a form which is readily accessible by IPCC. And something philanthropies could do for us is helped by, for example, convening workshops or meetings, the output of which is in a form that IPCC could start to assess. So that translation process, I think, would be actually extremely helpful, and that, that is not about the money side, it's, it's really in hand. Thanks. <clears throat> and
So I think one of the advantages that philanthropies have is the convening power to bring people together. Yes, there is always the promise potentially of, of money and that does motivate uh, people to engage. But even if there isn't necessarily money on the table, it's that ability to bring together actors, agencies, individuals uh, from quite a broad uh, uh, swathe of, of uh, uh, backgrounds and perspectives. Um, and I think that's that's a real advantage that, that not just for events like, like these, but actually something that allows people to come together for more than just an hour and a half, or, or just talking at people, but to have a real meaningful conversation. Uh, and to, to try and bring that awareness and understanding uh, on, a, on a more substantial level, even if it is with individuals, but then it ultimately you have to start with individuals before you can change the system. Thank you very much, and thanks for, to the audience for attending and listening. To the panel, great points. As Francisco, you said, you know, we stand with so many crises right now, and we have to deal with them, we have to invent a different future changing paradigm, how we educate, how we organize, how we produce, how we live, and how we make decisions, and also how we collaborate. Because you know, if we don't see this collaboration, and talking about social crisis and government, I want to add the word collaboration, but else we will never see the result of what we want to see. And we can tell it. So, just to say that this is not the end, it's barely the beginning. Uh, the conversation will continue. We and the foundations will continue. Shalom, shalom, I hope your message is still at the set right now. That you know, the foundation will keep uh, nudging and pushing and being there as friends and family to uh, help this. So thanks a lot. Uh, bring the message of the triple crisis and the need for triple action and triple ideas to uh, the West Park, because it's not only here it needs to be heard, it's across the world. Thank you. Yes.